Welcome to NTN Nightly. I am Janelle Novel. This edition stops stories. A 52-year-old male is the first non-national on St. Lucia's list of COVID-19 related deaths. The Departments of Education and Health and Wellness through rigorous protocols ensure the safety of students. And the policy must farmers stay afloat despite increased competition on the international market. The Department of Health and Wellness on Wednesday, 13 January 2021, reported that four more patients at the respiratory hospital have recovered from COVID-19, while 12 more have been diagnosed with the virus. One of the newly registered cases passed away, becoming the first non-national COVID-19 related death in St. Lucia. The individual is a 52-year-old male, a national of the United Kingdom. He arrived in St. Lucia on December 30th, 2020 and died on January 9th, 2021. And he was not in care at the time of his passing. Condolences are extended to the family and loved ones of, these indiv of this individual on their recent loss. The UK Nationals passing brings the total number of COVID-19 related deaths in St. Lucia to six. The remaining cases are nationals who were in isolation for care. Eleven of the cases are St. Lucia nationals ranging in age from one year to 73 years. They are from Castries, Babano and Grosley districts. These individuals were seen at the Community Respiratory Clinic where they were assessed and tested for COVID-19. They were placed in quarantine by health practitioners pending the receipt of their test results. Arrangements have been made to place these individuals into isolation. Epidemiological links have been established for five of those cases thus far and investigations are ongoing by the contact tracing team to determine the possible existence of epidemiological links for the other six cases. The island's total number of confirmed cases stand at 502. 319 patients have since recovered and there are currently 177 active cases, all being stable and none requiring critical care. Noting the importance of students' return to the physical classroom setting, the Departments of Education and Health and Wellness have implemented rigorous COVID-19 protocols in schools to ensure the safety of all. Officials are confident that these protocols at educational institutions are such that if one child is a suspected case, it will not mean the overall collapse of the education sector. Details in this report by Jesse Leos. What to do if a child becomes sick at school? Staff of educational institutions have been briefed on the procedure for managing a suspected case within the student population. Should a child display signs or report symptoms of infectious illness consistent with COVID-19, he or she is to be immediately isolated in a designated isolation room until pickup. The parent or guardian is to be notified and will be responsible for picking up and transporting that child to a respiratory clinic for testing and evaluation. If their test results return negative, the child may return to school after their symptoms go away. If the test is positive, the school will be contacted by the Department of Health and protocols for contact tracing will be initiated. Chief Environmental Health Officer Parker Ragnanan indicates that the controlled environment of educational institutions guided by these procedures are a safer option for school-aged children at this time. Up to January 5, 2021, 37 children between the ages 0 to 17 years contracted COVID-19 on island while they were out of school. Even with, even with our students being out of school, many times they are not within a protected environment. Uh, they are out there on the streets, you see them in groups, you see them on the beach, and they are exposed as well. And so the question really is the exposure at school. How much more exposed would the child be at school as compared to not being at school? Ahead of the new term, school staff have been assured that any possible exposure of COVID-19 will be communicated to them and the wider school population. And a list of close contacts of the confirmed case will be drawn up, starting from two days before development of symptoms. 
Close contacts will be notified, tested and quarantined for 14 days. The classroom occupied by the confirmed case will be cleaned and disinfected and the diagnosed student will be isolated according to protocols. He or she will be isolated until the symptoms clear up and a new PCR test result comes back negative. Only then will that student be able to return to school. Last October, all schools on island were closed when a Castries comprehensive student tested positive. Ragnanan suggests that it will take more than one positive test to shut schools again. You would re remember the domino kind of effect that this one experience had on the island. The question is really, if there is a situation at one individual school, should every school on the island remain closed as a result? That is the question. And therefore, in all other business sectors, so we've had uh, um, persons uh, at, at different business places who have contracted the disease, but have we seen all business, businesses shut down on the island? So we need to look at it very, very carefully and take very strategic approaches in terms of how we do things. Health officials refer to evidence which shows that children are less likely than adults to be transmitters of disease and that child-to-child -child transmission is uncommon. For the Government Information Service, I am Jesse Leons reporting. The Department of Education, Innovation and Gender Relations during a recent press conference indicated that many factors had to be considered in the closure and subsequent reopening of school. One such factor, according to Minister for Education, Honorable Dr. Gil Rigabert, was the overall well-being of students. The minister noted that school remains a safe space for a number of students. One of the issues we struggled with when we were previously forced to close schools. And among the issues we've had to consider with respect to reopening of school include, one, the nutritional support that many students benefit from while in school, which means that when they are out of school, we cannot guarantee that they are getting the requisite age-appropriate nutritional support. Further, though it is an unsavory topic, for many of our children, school is the only safe space that they know. And uh, our school counselors, who fall under the leadership of Miss Eugene, along with other stakeholders, have been very keen to ensure that we can bring those students back into schools, which is really, for many of them, a very safe space. Minister Honorable Dr. Rigabert explained that with the acknowledgement that the school feeding program was inadequately meeting the needs of students, a new school feeding policy has been adopted. Previously, we recognized that the school feeding program was implemented only at the primary school level. And the question was asked very often, when that child then moves on to secondary school, is there an automatic change in the economic circumstance of his or her family? So over the last two or three years, we have started with a pilot feeding program in secondary schools, and we've been able over time to include more participating schools onto that school feeding program. I'm elated to say that we are now informed by a scientific, technical school feeding policy in school, school feeding policy, which means that thanks to the partnership of Ministry of Health again and Ms. Ms. people like Ms. Hunt, for example, we've been able to speak to the nutritional content of, of that which we uh, share with students in school. We've addressed the, issues, the issue of sugars as well, artificial sweeteners and what that means for our students. The Department of Education is also considering the expansion of the school feeding program so as to include students who, due to their parents' change in economic situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic, may now require that support. We are grateful for the new school feeding policy. Two, that we 
are mindful of the extended or expanded need, especially given the economic challenges that families now face, many of who would have been displaced by COVID-19 through the loss of their jobs. And so we have to double our efforts to meet children who perhaps previously had no need to be on a school feeding program, but may very well have to be entertained uh, and catered for uh, moving forward precisely because of the new economic situation that their parents have found themselves in. Minister for Education, Honorable Dr. Gil Rigabert. As long as vaccination doses remain limited, the world cannot rely on vaccinations to flatten the pandemic curve. So said Director of the Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne. While vaccination doses remain limited, the director noted that there are three priority areas that remain critical in controlling the spread of COVID-19 in the region. The first is to ensure equitable access to the tools, both new and old, to prevent and treat COVID-19. We must ensure that health workers have the protective gear and equipment that they need to do their jobs safely, and that every person who requires hospitalization can access the basic medications they need, ISOE beds if, if that is necessary, to manage and treat the conditions. This is especially challenging as cases surge and supply chains are strained. With the arrival of vaccines, we must ensure not just that doses are produced quickly, but they are equitably delivered and swiftly across every country, regardless of income. This, Dr. Etienne explained, will require global and regional collaboration and solidarity with donors, pitching in resources through mechanisms like the COVAX facility. Another priority area is the quick action by leaders in the region to foster unity. This pandemic has taught us time and time again that leadership determines the effectiveness of a country's response. As we look to the year ahead, Leaders will face difficult choices as we work to flatten the transmission curve. And that's why we need leaders to act transparently so that the public understands their decisions and the scientific evidence that is behind those decisions so we can rally people around a shared plan. We need leaders to act in the interest of public health, not political gain by working together to make the best use of the tools to prevent this virus. Dr. Etienne assured that PAHO remains committed and stands ready to assist all countries in the region in the fight against the coronavirus. We don't have much time to lose, but we cannot beat the pandemic without strong vaccine delivery plans. And that's why PAHO is working with every country in our region to help secure the vaccine doses that countries need to protect their populations. We're also providing support with vaccine demand planning, logistics and cold chain management, surveillance and information system strengthening, health worker training, and vaccine communication, communication planning, among others. Director of PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne, speaking at the first media briefing for the year 2021. This is NTN Nightly. Please stay with us. COVID-19 is a new pandemic disease as declared by the World Health Organization. It is transmitted directly by respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes, or indirectly through rubbing the face with contaminated hands. There is still no specific treatment or vaccine against COVID-19, and as such, the farming community should adhere to some special recommendations. Reduce your farm labor to only essential workers. Ensure regular hand washing with soap and water or use 60% to 95% alcohol-based hand sanitizer until soap and water are available. Clean all work surfaces and farm tools such as cutlasses, forks and sprayers with a 10% bleach solution. 
ensure that toilets are cleaned thoroughly after each use and sanitized daily. Prohibit visitors to the farms. Limit contact among farm workers and promote social distances, ensuring six feet between each worker. And promote a no handshaking or unnecessary touch policy. More than ever before, your important role as the gatekeepers of St. Lucia's nutritional health and food security should be taken seriously. When you exercise these precautions, you not only safeguard your health, but also continue to allow all St. Lucians access to freshly grown fruits, vegetables, and other local crops. Remember, it is our responsibility to ensure our nation eats fresh, St. Lucia's best. Welcome back. The Poale Simos Farmers Association, guided by Export St. Lucia, have maintained their exports despite increased competition on the international market for the high-priced commodity. Details in this report. Export St. Lucia says the island CMOS still attracts a higher price than any other CMOS on the market, despite increased competition from Latin America and other Caribbean territories. However, some CMOS farmers on island have noted with anxiety a reduction in rates per pound since more players have entered this mariculture business internationally. CEO of Export St. Lucia, Sunita Daniel, weighs in on this concern. The international market price would go down because you have so many entrants to the market, now you'd find that there would be complaints. Um, so they have to decide on their own whether for their business model they, could, they should continue um, exporting CMOS or not. What we want to advise persons is that the market for CMOS remains, the demand for CMOS remains, what you should not expect, and I don't think any business person should really expect, is to get abnormally high prices for your CMOS. Export St. Lucia works with the Prale CMOS Farmers Association, and Daniel reports that the association maintains high standards in the market and turns a profit. We, as a government agency, have continued to work with our CMOS farmers. We continue to give them the support that they require. We continue working with them on their packaging, and we continue working with them on the quality of product. The farmers we work with are selling their CMOS, and they're making a profit. She encourages private entities operating CMOS farms and exporting to submit a quality product. We've had a lot of persons not exactly doing what they're supposed to do in terms of maintaining the standards, in terms of how um, the branding and the packaging of the product is supposed to be done. So the farmers we work with know the standards. They know the branding, they know the packaging requirements. A lot of persons have entered the market, are doing their own thing, and so this is what would happen when, when they go on their own. The Export St. Lucia CEO laments that buyers have reported substandard CMOS coming from some private local entities entities that do not have any ties with her organization. This, she says, is impacting the sector's reputation. We know of persons who have exported substandard CMOS. We know distributors will send us pictures and tell us this is the CMOS we're getting. We don't know those persons. These are persons, private individuals who have gone out and sold CMOS and doing their own thing and the product is now, the product they're sen selling is so substandard that it's now affecting the entire St. Lucia CMOS brand. So we want to caution persons. Um, if you're entering the business to do it right. Daniel advises CMOS farmers who may have issues with production to seek guidance from the Department of Fisheries and for branding assistance, export St. Lucia. St. Lucia's is the first profitable cultivation of seaweeds in the Atlantic Ocean or the Caribbean Sea. For the Government Information Service, I am Jesse Leons reporting. Mandatory pre-departure testing for all international arrivals to England will come into effect worldwide from the 15th of January 2021, including for passengers departing from Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. A limited exemption has been granted until the 21st of January for Clock Greenwich Mean Time GMT for arrivals from Barbados, Antigua and Barbuda and St. Lucia to help Britons in this country's return home. 
Inbound passengers to England will need to show proof of a negative COVID-19 test result taken no more than three days prior to departure. The UK government has confirmed that mandatory pre-departure testing for all inbound passengers to England will come into force from Friday 15 January 2021 as an added measure to safeguard public health against the coronavirus and its variants. A limited exemption has been granted until Thursday 21st January for Clock GMT to help Britons in Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and St. Lucia return home. This decision reflects current infrastructure challenges in these countries, including limited COVID-19 testing capacity and heightened demand for tests. Persons arriving into England from these three islands from the 4 o'clock GMT on the 21st of January onward will be required to comply in full with the new requirements. Visitors are strongly encouraged to use this time to review and clarify their plans for return to England, including considering options to revise flight departures and, if necessary, put in place suitable arrangements for qualifying pre-departure tests. In preparation for travel, passengers will need to find a testing provider which meets the standards set out on by the UK government, the majority of which will be PCR tests. Full details of requirements can be found at www.gov.uk. Prior to departure, passengers will be required to present proof of a negative COVID-19 test result taken no more than three days before departing to transport operators, as well as their passenger locator form. Carriers may deny boarding to those who do not have a negative test result. The UK Border Force will conduct spot checks on arrival into England. Passengers who arrive at the border without proof of a negative result will be subject to an immediate £500 fine. For people arriving from countries not on the travel corridor list, they will be required to complete a mandatory self-isolation period and the travel corridors list is regularly reviewed to manage the risk of imported cases of COVID-19 from high-risk countries. Passengers still have the option to reduce their self-isolation period as part of the test to release scheme launched last month unless they have been in South Africa, Angola, Botswana, to name a few, in the 10 days prior to their travel in England. The current advice for persons in the UK remains that they must stay at home and not travel abroad unless it is for a permitted exempt reason. That brings us to the end of NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norville.